Hey guys, welcome to Fun Learning. In this video, we are going to discuss about the patellofemoral joint biomechanics. With no further delay, let's get started. Articular surfaces. The posterior surface of the patella articulate with the femoral sulcus that is present at the anterior aspect of the distal femur to form patellofemoral joint. First, let us discuss about the posterior surface of the patella. The posterior surface of the patella has two ridges and reface it. Okay. Posterior surface of the patella is divided by vertical ridge. This vertical ridge divides the articular surfaces into medial and lateral facet. Most patella also have a second vertical ridge towards the medial border that separate the medial facet from an extreme medial edge known as odd facet of the patella. So, uh, the posterior surface of the patella, we have two vertical ridges and three facets. Three facets are nothing but medial facet, lateral facet and odd facet. Now, let us discuss about the femoral sulcus. Femoral sulcus has a trochlear group which divides the femoral sulcus into medial and lateral facet for articulation with medial and lateral facet of the patella. The patellofemoral joint is one of the most incongruent joint because of the much smaller articular surface area of the patella when compared with the femur. Okay, so patellofemoral joint is one of the incongruent joint because the articular surface of the patella is very much smaller when compared to the articular surface of the femur. Now, let us discuss about the patellofemoral joint congruence in detail. Uh, the patellofemoral uh, joint is said to be more stable when the knee is in flexion and less stable when the knee is in extension. Why? Because when the knee is in extension, the contact area between the patella and the femur, femoral sulcus is very much lesser. Okay, well, the patellofemoral instability is more in knee extension when compared to knee flexion. When the knee is extended, only the inferior pole of the patella is making contact with the femur. As the knee begins to flex, the patella slides down the femur, increases the surface contact area. The first consistent contact occurs at 15 to 20 degree of knee flexion. By 90 degree of knee flexion, all portion of the patella have experienced some contact with the femoral sulcus with the exception of the odd facet. Beyond 90 degree of knee flexion, the smaller odd facet also make contact with the medial femoral condyle. At full flexion, the patella is lodged in the intercondylar group. Thus, a greater potential for patellar instability is at knee extension when compared with knee flexion. Now we are, to, we are going to discuss about one more important concept which are nothing but insole solvity index which is nothing but the ratio between the length of the patella tendon to the diagonal length of the patella. Okay, this ratio is usually 1 is to 1. A markedly short tendon produces an abnormally low position of the patella on the femoral sulcus known as patellar baja. A eye riding patella is referred to as patellar alta. The patellar alta and patellar baja are the two a different condition. Okay, wow. Well, at the patellar baja, what happens? The patella will be below the femoral sulcus. Whereas in the case of patellar alta, the patella will be above the femoral sulcus. Okay. Now, let us discuss about the motion of the patella in detail. So, we have patellar flexion extension, lateral medial patella tilt, lateral medial patella shift, medial and lateral patella rotation. First, let us discuss about the patellar flexion and extension which occur at the sagittal plane and coronal axis. So, when you flex, what happens? The patella moves inferiorly. Okay, well, so there will be like the patella is pulled down by the tibia, gliding inferiorly and rotating on the femoral condyle. That with distal apex of patella moving posteriorly. Patella flexion. Very easy. So when you flex your knee, what happens? The patella glide inferiorly. Okay. So, when you extend the knee, what happens? The patella glides superiorly while rotating up and round the femoral condyle. 
वेरी इजी सो पेटेलर फ्लेक्शन में पेटेलर मूव इनफीरियरली पेटेलर एक्सटेंशन में पेटेलर मूव सुपीरियरली सो वॉट एपन्स एट रेट्रल और मीडियल पेटेला तिल्ट सो डूरिंग रेट्रल पेटेला तिल्ट the radial edge of the patella will tilt towards the radial femoral condyle whereas during medial patella tilt what happen the medial edge of the patella will tilt towards the medial femoral condyle and a uh, radial and medial patella shift which occur at the frontal plane so during a uh, radial patella shift what happens the patella will move towards the radial femoral condyle whereas during medial uh, patella shift what happens the patella will move towards the medial femoral condyle now let us discuss about the medial and radial patella rotation which occur at the antero posterior axis medial rotation occur when the apex of the patella pointing towards the medial femoral condyle and the base of the patella will move closer to the radial femoral condyle so the exactly reverse occur at the radial rotation so during medial rotation the apex will move towards the medial femoral condyle whereas the base will move towards the radial femoral condyle now let us discuss about the patello femoral joint stress the patello femoral joint reaction force is influenced by both the magnitude of the quadriceps force and the knee angle As the quadriceps contract, patella is pulled superiorly by the quadriceps tendon, and the patella tendon will resist this pull inferiorly. The combination of this pull produces a posterior compression force of the patella on the femur that varies with the amount of knee flexion. At full extension, at full extension of knee, the posterior compressive force is minimized thus there is low patello femoral joint stress with the knee in full extension as knee flexion progresses there will be increased joint reaction force and in turn produces greater patello femoral joint compressive forces this compression occur whether the quadriceps muscle is active or passive during knee flexion the patello femoral joint reaction force can become very high during routine daily activities like walking running etc so what they are trying to say here is the patello femoral joint stress is greater in knee flexion when compared to knee extension okay va so at the normal patello femoral joint the medial facet bear the large stress a level compared with the radial facet why because the radial facet is large in size when compared to medial facet as the radial facet size adhigama irukiradunala force equal a dissipate aidum ana medial facet oda size kammiya irukiradunala force vande andha alavuku dissipate aagadu adanalu stress level vande medial facet ku adhigama irukum when compared to a radial facet several mechanisms are present to dissipate the joint stress on patella in general and medial facet in particular specifically from 30 to 70 degree of knee flexion the magnitude of contact force is higher at the thick cartilage of medial facet this articular cartilage is the thicker articular cartilage in the human body thus it can withstand the substantial compressive force okay va enna solla varanga appdin sonna there are several mechanisms so that is going to help your medial facet for dissipating the force equally so one vandu enna solranga appadina the medial articular cartilage irukla that is uh, that is quite thicker in nature when compared to the other articular cartilage in the human body thus it can able to withstand substantial amount of compressive forces and second mechanism support mechanism enna appdin sonna the moment arm of quadriceps muscle at this range of motion is considered to be higher so moment arm adhigama irundichina force eppadi irukum kammiya irukum seriya so moment arm adhigama irukiradunala thereby force vandu kammiya irukum torque adhig so moment arm is actually proportional to torque so when there is increased moment arm there be increased torque with less force okay va and also moment arm of quadriceps muscle is maximized thereby minimizing the patello femoral joint compression 
As knee flexion proceeds, there will be increase in contact area and compressive force helps to minimize the uh, patellofemoral joint stress until 90 degree of knee flexion. So, there is three mechanism that is going to help in dissipating the patellofemoral joint stress. One one is there will be thicker medial articular cartilage. In the one second one, there will be greater momentum. Third one, there will be increased contact area. So, it is all about patellofemoral joint stress 90 degree where you dissipate from it. Beyond 90 degree knee flexion, contact area once again diminishes. However, some of the compressive force on the patella is dissipated by the cordyceps tendon. So, beyond 90 degree of knee flexion, your cordyceps tendon is going to help in the dissipating patellofemoral joint stress. Okay, well. Now, let us discuss about the frontal plane patellofemoral joint stability. Frontal plane instability at near full knee extension, the contact area is reduced or action line of the cordyceps and the patella tendon do not coincide because of the physiological valgus that normally exists between tibia and femur, resulting in a slight rateral pull of the patella. Soft tissue stabilizers must, must assume more responsibility for medial lateral stability in extension and bony stability is reduced in extension. So, what they are trying to say here is frontal plane instability is at knee extension because of two reasons. One, the contact area between the articular surface is highly reduced. Second is the action line of cordyceps and the patella tendon will not coincide. As a result, what happens? There will be slight radial pull of the patella. So, in the render reason, nala, frontal plane instability will be at knee extension. Okay, wa? so uh, during this time, so only your soft tissue is going to help because the bony stability is highly reduced. Le, yeah? So, uh, soft tissue stabilizers must assume more responsibility for medial radial stability in extension as bony stability is reduced in extension. So, there are two stabilizers namely longitudinal stabilizers and transverse stabilizers. The longitudinal stabilizers are nothing but the cordyceps tendon superiorly, patella tendon inferiorly, patellotibial ligament which are part of extensor retinaculum. This forms the longitudinal stabilizer. Whereas the transverse stabilizers are nothing but the superficial portion of extensor retinaculum. So, the medial patellar retinaculum and radial patellar retinaculum are together referred to as extensor retinaculum, right? So, the medial part of the, sorry, the medial patellar retinaculum is going to contribute 60 percentage of passive restraining force against radial translation of patella, okay, wa? So, longitudinal and menin part, no? transverse, la, nothing but the extensor retinaculum. Extensor retinaculum, we have two, medial patellar retinaculum, radial patellar retinaculum. And this is going to restrict 60 percentage of the radial translation of patella. Another important passive stabilizer is the anterior, anteriorly protruding radial lip of the femoral sulcus. So, femoral sulcus, la, Okay, wow. Rateral lip one is anterior or protrude. Even large rateral force will not sublux or dislocate the patella provided that rateral lip of the femoral sulcus is of sufficient height. And there is one condition known as trochlear dysplasia. What happens? There will be flattening of the rateral lip of the femoral sulcus. In an anterior protrude, I will under condition la, Anterior protrusion of radial lip of femoral sulcus is absent. Now we are going to discuss about another important concept which is nothing but the Q angle. So Q angle is angle between a line connecting anterior superior iliac spine to the midpoint of the patella and a line connecting the tibial tuberosity and the midpoint of patella. So, so I will show you the diagram. I hope so you can see this diagram. The angle between these two lines is referred to as Q angle. So, Q angle is the angle between a line connecting the anterior superior iliac spine to the midpoint of the patella and extension of a line connecting the tibial tubercle and the midpoint of the patella. 
This angle is most commonly measured when the knee is in full extension or slight flexion. The Q angle is approximately 10 to 15 degree. Okay, well, increased Q angle may increase the radial force on the patella. Substantial increase in radial force can actually sublux or dislocate the patella over the femoral sulcus. The Q angle is usually measured with knee at full extension because the radial force of the uh, radial force on the patella are more problematic in this position. So with knee flexion, what happens? I said previously at knee knee flexion there will be increased posterior compressive force abdin so in a previous as on so with knee flexion the posterior compressive force is greater and the patella is set more firmly with the deeper part of the femoral sulcus such that even a very large radial force on the patella is unlikely to result in dislocation so posterior compressive force adhigama irukiradunala patella vandu femoral sulcus oda deeper part la poi irukum so appadi deeper part la irukum bodu romba adhigamaana radial force kudutha mattume you can able to dislocate the patella so adanala knee extension la da radial force adhigama kudutho patella vandu dislocate aadathukku vaippu adhigama irukku q angle greater than 20 degree there is some structural mal alignment one problem with using Q angle as a measure of radial pull on patella is that this is an estimate line of pull of quadriceps. It is does not necessarily reflect the actual line of pull of quadriceps. That is Q angle of being written. We estimate a line of pull of quadriceps muscle. It is the actual line of pull of muscle. If there is imbalance occur between vastus radialis muscle and vastus medialis muscle, a Q angle may lead to an incorrect estimation of radial force on patella. So, genu valgum apo, there will be increased Q angle. Genu varum condition, there will be decreased Q angle. Genu varum can further, further increase the obliquity of femur. And concomitantly, the radial pull of the quadriceps will also be increased. Genu varum exhibit less obliquity of femur and therefore have a diminished radial pull of quadriceps muscle. Increased medial femoral torsion and increased radial tibial torsion will also result in increase of Q angle. So, when the patient has patellofemoral pain, we should avoid deep flexion in weight bearing activity and uh, avoid the final 30 degree of extension during non weight bearing knee extension exercises. With this, I am completing today's video. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel.